Who comes to mind when you think of a multi-sport athlete? Old school names like Jim Thorpe or Babe Diedrichson Zaharias? Golden era names like Deion Sanders or Bo Jackson? More modern names like Julius Peppers or Tony Gonzalez? Or the super modern names like Kyler Murray or Tim Tebow, I guess? Either way, there are dozens more names that you could list before you ever reached our subject today. Someone whose career has been turned into trivia when it is anything but. This is what you don't know about the only man to play in both a World Series and a major golf championship. Welcome to What You Don't Know About Sports, where we delve into the forgotten stories, teams, and athletes of sports history and question widely held takes on today's sports. I'm Matt, and this is Blake. Hello, friends. <laughs> For the last time at the Final Four, though. I know. <laughs> and, I and, to. Yeah. and today, we've got the answer to one of the best baseball and golf trivia questions, even though it was more than that. Sammy Bird. This is uh, first off. This is a listener submission. Thanks to our listener Corey for giving us this idea. Shout whoop out whoop. for that. Uh, but Blake, before we get started, who's your favorite two sport athlete? I th- you said his name in the intro. When I think of a when I think of a two sport athlete, the two people that immediately come to mind are Deion Sanders and Bo Jackson. Uh, we talked about Jim Thorpe in a prior episode. I feel like he could have played 10 sports at yeah. the same time. Like he, he, I mean, he, he played football, baseball, and he was a track athlete. So like multi-sport. Yeah. Um, two sport, like professional in both somehow at the same time, I still don't really understand it, but <laughs> we could, we could, we could do a whole episode on debating who was better at either of the two or both at the same time or whatever. But um, either Dion or Bo are the first two people that come to mind when I think of two sport. Uh, yeah, for me too. Like, because it, Dion was doing some of his cool stuff when I was young enough, like a child to take it in and, and be superly impressed by it, which the stuff he was doing truly is impressive. Um, he played an NFL game and a World Series game same day, right? Same ridiculous. Yeah, so that's that's you know not normal. Um, I also I Julius Peppers and like Donovan McNabb and a couple of other dudes that played football primarily, but also high level Power Five Division One basketball impressed me too um that was a thing that was done more like when i was a kid less so now for whatever reason Mm -hmm. that all i was always intrigued by that um dave winfield is a name that doesn't come up in these but i think he was drafted by he was obviously drafted he played major league baseball but i think he was drafted in the nba and maybe the nfl Whoa! Someone's gonna fact check me on that and tell me that I'm wrong. That was off the that was off the cuff there. I just that just popped <laughs> in my head while I was talking, so that may be completely incorrect. Uh, it may be the wrong name, but um, there's yeah, a genius that, out there that'll tell us. Yes, I miss I miss the two sport athlete. Uh, now, obviously, they'll they'll show up. You know, Kyler Murray's having to choose between football and baseball. Russell Wilson had to choose between football and baseball. Um, but I miss, I miss when you didn't have to, I mean, I guess you always had to choose eventually, but I miss, you know, the prominent star two sport athlete, wish there would be another one. That's the interesting part about, uh, that's the interesting part about Sammy Bird is that he had an entire sporting career in one sport, retired from that one, and then had an entire secondary career and really, golf is probably the only one that you can do that and be competitive in because of how old you can be 
while playing golf. You don't have to be a young spring chicken. You like that's something that plenty of people don't get decent or good at at all, or if they ever get good at it until they're older, because it just takes so many repetitions and so much time and stuff. It's not something you have to be 22 years old at the height of your peak athletic career. You can be older and be good. And so it golf has got to be the only, or probably the easiest, I should say sport to be able to do what he did, where you take, you do one sport until it runs out. And then you just, the second one that you pick up almost has to be golf. Because, because golf can be so recreational, like you said, at any age, like anybody can go and a lot of, and a lot of people do right. All walks of life, their, their record, their hobby, whether they're an athlete or a banker or anything else, their hobby is golf. And so that lends itself to an athlete being able to take, like Tony Romo's qualified or attempted to qualify for the U S open and gotten close a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Right. So it, it is like it would almost have to be in this situation. You're right. Golf or that little bit of time when poker was on ESPN and we were talking about whether or not it was a sport. Um, <laughs> I guess <laughs> that was also a thing you could take up in your in your is poker time. a sport. That's our next episode, everyone. Put it on the Twitter. Put up a poll. Um, <laughs> all right. So. Uh, let us know your favorite two sports athletes on social medias and uh, and we'll take a look at some of those. So to tell you a little bit about our guy here, Samuel Dewey Bird was born on October 5th, 1906 in Bremen, Georgia, but he moved at the age of six to Birmingham, Alabama, where he would remain throughout his school years and would return to off and on throughout his life. There he played baseball and basketball, traditional multi-sport athlete like you would be in a small town. He played those sports, did okay in school, and was also trained by his father in bricklaying. Quick moment here, if anybody like me was wondering what the difference between bricklaying and masonry was, because I thought it was just like a snide thing you said to people, masons work with all kinds of stones while brick layers work with concrete blocks or brick in particular, like building walls and stuff. But Masons work with all kinds of stones. The more Didn't you know, know that, yeah. the more, you yeah. know, yeah. Thought it was, I thought it was synonymous, but no, two different jobs. Nice. Yeah. Most interestingly to our story, while he was playing baseball at school, he picked up the game of golf because they, his family lived neighboring the Roebuck Golf Course in Birmingham. He was taught the game by his brother, who would go on to become a pretty respected kind of instructor in the Southeast. And he eventually became a caddy at Roebuck Golf Course. We've had this kind of career path for golfers before learn the game, become a caddy, become a golfer. Um, And then Bird himself also became an instructor during the off seasons of his baseball career. So uh, pretty normal childhood, had a trade that he could fall back on, golf, baseball, um, just well-rounded youth, which we will say again, something that children need not to specialize in one sport, but to play multiple ones. It's all about exposure, people. All about exposure. Expose them to as much as possible, and then they'll let you know. But, uh, but yeah, it's uh, the the pathway you mentioned being being taught the game by anybody. He obviously was interested enough in it to work in it, and then he was obviously interested enough in it to become an instructor at some point, and obviously he becomes a professional golfer after he's done playing baseball. We kind of established that already. So it is this pathway that you often see. Uh, this is very common for golfers. You just kind of get in wherever you can at a golf course. Just you could do be doing anything, picking up balls, whatever you got to do to be around the sport. Because again, it's all about exposure. Right. After Bird graduated school, he became a professional baseball player. He was that good. Signed with his hometown Birmingham Barons. Found out they I. I knew a lot of the minor league teams were that old, did not realize that the the Barons of Michael Jordan fame were this old. But mm. signed with the Birmingham Barons, they were in the A-Class Southern Association. At the time, 
Now, obviously, A-class is the lowest level, split into several different ones. But at the time, that was the second level of the miners. There was a double A ahead of it, so that had already been created. But below it were the remnants of the old original minor league system, which was A, B, C, and D classifications. Uh, They were an A level, which gave them reserve clause status. So back in that time, you signed a contract with a team. Uh, It was kind of open-ended how long that would last. But as long as you were under contract, you had to play for the team that had your contract. No free agency. You could be sold. You could be traded. Much like uh, everyone's going to cringe that hates this when we do it. Much like European soccer in today's (laughs) world uh, is the way, honestly, is the way this system worked then. And to illustrate that, it is a great system. It's great. To illustrate that, he was signed by a Class A team, but for his first season, he was sent to Class D He was sent to the Tri-State League to play for a team in Jonesboro. That team then folded after 59 games, and he was sent to the Class D Cotton States League to play for the Alexandria Reds. All told, his rookie season in professional baseball, he hit 316 in 84 games, which was good enough for his second season in 1927 to begin in Class B. This was the South Atlantic League. It was called the Sally League at the time. It's now the Double A Southern League, which many people from our neck of the woods would be familiar with. Our Carolina Mudcats used to be in that league. He played for the Knoxville Smokies there in his second season. He had 500 plate appearances, played 150 games. He hit 331. So impressive in his first two seasons of professional ball. Don't take my word for it. The New York Yankees became so impressed with his potential that they has purchased his contract in 1927, two years out of high school. Uh, he then went with them, was uh, sent to a different Class A team, this time in the Eastern League, playing for Albany in 1928. He hit 371 for the season, which was, after three minor league seasons, good enough to be called up to the bigs for 1929. So a pretty, pretty quick rise in minor league baseball and a pretty talented rise in minor league baseball in, in what was at the time, essentially the Yankees best farm team. He was hitting 371 the year before they put him up. That's pretty solid. And if you're doing the math, uh, 1929, he would have been 22 or 23 years old and like had already worked his way up through through all the minor leagues and uh, and I, okay i can't be the only one who needs like a link chart to visualize all this minor league stuff all the leagues yeah. moving around and how they've changed over time and stuff it is so complicated <laughs> to know which ones uh, and like not even teams not even the teams leaving and coming back and leaving and whatever but just the divisions, just the divisions and the classifications and when again, like ABCD, well, then a triple A came on top. Well, then a D and C and B eventually left. And now there's a triple A. And now like yeah. how all of that took place over time, I think is fascinating. I have no idea how it all works. It I I I didn't realize when I knew I knew kind of how it happened, but I didn't know the wins. So this was right after that double A thing had just happened when he showed up. So the original classification was like A, B, C, D, which makes sense. Like this mm-hmm. is A, B, like, cool, this we're fine. Uh, like the Wilson Tops played at a, a D level. And so those were how much you could pay a player a week. And it governed how much somebody could purchase a player for. So it was kind of less European soccer, not just wide open, but like there were certain amounts you could pay. And then, then it got stupid. Like then they were like, "Oh, well, there were teams. <laughs> there were teams as cities grew in America. There started to be cities that were bigger than than anybody in A, B, C, and D. They were like, "Well, we shouldn't. You know, we got more people. We got more money. We got more business. We're not going to be this." And so they started a double A. And you would think next would be triple A, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> in between double A and A, they started an A one classification. Yeah, no. You lost me. (laughs) It is why. And then triple A came on and then they they did it. But even now it's stupid. Like because there's an A and a short season A 
and a rookie A. And they've they've renamed <laughs> some of it, but it's like, come on, can we just have four levels? Like, we don't no. need six minor league teams per team. We can't do. It. We can't have nice things, and this is why. This is why. All right, so Bird makes his way to the New York Yankees. That's awesome. Most decorated team in the history of baseball. Great. Problem he has is that the outfield of the 1929 Yankees and the 1930 Yankees, this era of Yankees very regularly was manned by Ben Chapman, who would be an all-star once the all-star game became a thing. So he was a several-time all-star. Uh, another outfield spot was occupied by Hall of Famer Earl Combs, a regular in the Murderer's Row lineups of the late 20s. And uh, the last outfield spot was taken up by a late stage, but still a person you probably know, Babe Ruth. Who's that guy? <laughs> Who is that guy? He was the other outfielder. And by late stage, I mean that he was old and out of shape, but he was still putting up 1,000 plus OPS seasons. Not like, fair. Like, you know, all-time great seasons uh, as an <laughs> as a out-of-shape dude just running around the bases. In his rookie season, he cracked the lineup as a fill-in for Ruth in the month of June. And over the course of the season, got 202 plate appearances. He hit 312 in his rookie season. Not a full season, like playing sparingly. That's about a third of the at-bats you would need uh, for a full season pinch hitter. He was basically, if we had this term back in the 1920s and 30s, would be the team's fourth outfielder, right? The guy you could plug in when somebody else needs uh, a day off. More importantly, perhaps, he got a regular role as Babe Ruth's everyday golfing partner. The two guys got together and played golf before, after, just whenever they could, games every single day. And quickly... Through his rookie season uh, and into his second season, he became known as the best golfer among Major League players. And this was a time when Major League Baseball players were really uh, picking up the game of golf kind of like a fad, much like the pickleball of 1929 in Major League (laughs) Baseball. Uh, Everybody was picking it up. So everybody's trying their hand at it, and he is the best while cracking the lineup for the Yankees. Jeez. Yeah, no wonder uh, his 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 second career basically started two years into his first career. <laughs> That's how quickly this is. I mean, he he became a professional. He became a major league player at twenty three, and then within a year of playing on the Yankees, he basically became the best golfer of the sport, and his second career was made already. Like his life was written, and he was twenty four years old. And and for reference, Babe Ruth was in his mid thirties at this point. So, you know that that is an age gap. Even then, like a, tw- a young twenties guy hanging out every day with a with a mid thirties guy, especially one with the reputation that Babe Ruth had, uh, that is that's a gap. Like that's some experience, some life experience that he's getting along the way too. But it's just you know recreational sport, so he's able to pick it up and and hang out with him. Uh, many stories talk about how he enjoyed taking Babe Ruth's money. So Ruth got paid more. <laughs> Bird made up for it on the golf course uh, every day. In 1930 and in 1931, so his next two seasons, he's going to remain a reserve player through that time, upping his plate appearances every year. He got 254 and then 281. He was hitting okay uh, around 280. Second or third season, he was hitting 274. But he was gaining a reputation in baseball for his fielding excellence, particularly in place of Ruth. One quote I mentioned, or I saw mentioned that uh, he, he subbed in. He was playing for Ruth in a game, and the guy mentioned that he was making plays that Ruth would have happily accepted on one bounce. You know, In other words, Ruth's too slow to play the outfield now. Uh, this guy was getting credit. One sports writer said, George W. Daly says, that the Alabama flash covered left field as Dixie is covered by the dew. Hmm. That's a quote from a sports writer. I love 1930s sports writing. It is the best. I wish I could write as elegantly as they did. As, yes. as Like today, I wish I could just do something. And just, 
I, don't, I, I just, you just can't think of those words. How do you, we just can't do that today. I don't it's think it's like, possible. It's just pretty and it's, mm-hmm. you understand the point and it's illustrative. And now today's sports writing is just like big man, boom. Like, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite the same. Uh, that's not all, not always, but anyway, <laughs> in 1932, uh, Bird got his best opportunity of cracking the New York Yankees lineup. He took over the center field spot from Earl Combs again, who uh, would eventually make his way into the Hall of Fame. He hit three home runs in the month of April, which were the same number of home runs he had hit the entire season in 1931. Everything is looking up, but it, throughout the month of May, he had sinus issues. Preach, dude. Which which Gosh. we all like can experience, right? Like, <laughs> but he didn't have Claritin and Zyrtec and sinus issues, infections on the such uh, were no like laughing matter in 1932. They could do you some serious harm. Uh, thank God for medicine now. Whew. And so these took him out of the lineup. Like he was he was out. He could not play to the point where Combs took the role back over. And in a Wally Pip situation, never gave the role back. So they they started the season wanting Bird to play center field. Sinus issues take him out, and Combs turns out he could still play. And so he continued to play. Uh, the rest of his Yankees career, he got the nickname Babe Ruth's Legs because, as we've illustrated, Babe Ruth, not the swiftest of foot in these days, uh, Bird would regularly come in as a defensive replacement or a pinch hitter late in games. So he didn't get a lot of plate appearances, but he did play in a lot of games in 1932. And this is what led to the first half of his trivia question, his World Series appearance in 1932. The Yankees famously played the Cubs. This is the World Series with the called shot in game three that we're not sure it happened right. Ruth points out to center field either because he's cussing the pitcher or he's calling his shot or he wasn't doing any of those things and it didn't actually happen. Like, whatever. We're going to go that it did and he was calling his shot because that's a better story. True. And that's all that matters. Yep, yep. Uh, but it is this World Series. The Yankees would sweep the Cubs in four games. In the bottom of the ninth of that fourth game, it was Sammy Bird that came in as a defense defensive replacement for Babe Ruth in left field. He played one half of one inning of the World Series, but he appeared in the World Series nonetheless. Thousands of Hall of the, not Hall of Famers, not thousands of Hall of Famers, but there are Hall of Famers who never played in the World Series, and there are thousands of baseball players who never appeared in one. He did, and he did because he was worthy of it. In 1933 and 1934, he had much of the same kind of uh, of season in his career. Uh, he didn't crack the lineup very much, about 200 plate appearances. He hit somewhere in the high 200s. He did lead the league in fielding percentage for an outfielder in 1934, uh, making um, safe putouts on 95% of his chances. But more importantly, his golf legend continued to grow at the same time. Tommy Armour, a golf hall of famer in 1932, said, Bird has one of the best swings I have seen anywhere. He has a true sound swing with exceptional power. I'd like to see that fellow have a chance to go out for golf in a serious way. And none other than Bobby Jones himself, founder of Augusta National and the Masters, said in 1933 after a round with Bird, He's the best man off the tee I ever saw. And when someone asked for clarification, he said, not one of the best, but the best. One word in this sentence, the best. Um, And in 1933, he won an amateur event, Southeast PGA, and then entered his first professional tournament down in Pinehurst, playing in a best ball, essentially an exhibition event. Uh, but played and played well in his first professional tournaments. At the same time, he makes a World Series in his professional baseball career. It feels like it's stalling out. He's making a lot of waves kind of behind the scenes in golf. Imagine imagine being that good at anything, right? Like making it to that level in anything. And then imagine 
that not even being your primary sport. Like he he made it to the point that he was competing in amateur events at the age of 27, 28 while still playing major league baseball as as little as he might have been playing, but he was still he was good enough to still be on a major league roster and good enough to win a PGA Tour. But now we've had this conversation uh here and privately whether like golfers today are as good as golfers a hundred years ago or whether the field is just better now and fight whatever you can argue that you can argue that whatever you you still don't see people becoming professional in two sports every day it's still ridiculous yeah absolutely absolutely this is this is something that took talent on a on a major level uh, in baseball, his fortunes changed a little bit in 1934. Uh, unfortunately, the New York Yankees did not win very much or as much as they wanted to in 1933. Uh, and so in 1934, going into that offseason, the Yankees parted ways with both Babe Ruth and his legs. Uh, <laughs> Babe, Babe Ruth. Uh, famously had a, a sour exit with the New York Yankees and they sold Sammy Bird to Cincinnati, not traded, straight up sold him to Cincinnati, who was going to play him every day. And they they did, more or less. He played 121 games in 1934, got his most played appearances of his career. Over 500 of them hit only 262, though, which in today's world would be great. Back then, very average and essentially, his prime was over. He was about at the age of 28 at this point. Uh, he was placed in reserve again in 1935, was essentially the team's fourth outfielder. And he got traded to the St. Louis Cardinals for 1936. He was going to be sent to their AAA team because we got to change the designations <gasps> in the middle of his career. Gosh. He was going to be sent down to the minors. And he didn't want to. That's a thing that happens. You don't want it. You, you've been a major leaguer. You've played in the World Series. You played for the Yankees. A trip to the minors is, even though it's the Cardinals, a trip to the minors is not something he wanted. He kind of lost interest in the game of baseball a little bit. And so he retired. Even when they came back to him and said, whoa, 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 no, 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 don't retire. We'll let you play. We'll let you be on the major league team. He still was out, right? He was, he was, he was ready to be done at this point. He retired having hit career average of 274. His career OPS was 762, which according to Bill James grades out at about average to above average. It's right on the line, the way he put it, 766 uh, six, six and above is above average. So he was, you know, right there at it. Still um, ridiculous. One record of note for him. He is the answer to another trivia question. Uh, first, this is not your actual trivia question, but Blake, do you know? I didn't know what this was this time. Do you know what an ultimate Grand Slam is? My first thought is that it ends a game. That is it. It is a is Grand it? Slam. Yeah, it's a Grand Slam that ends a game. So it's a walk-off Grand Slam. There's only been, I think, 18 of them in Major League Baseball history. He hit the third one all time, but he was a pinch hitter. He's the first pinch hitter, and I believe, I believe the it's not clear the records. I would have had to go and research each game to see when the guy came in, uh, and that's not the point of this story, so I didn't. But I believe he's the only pinch hitter to do this. He did it uh, on May twenty third, nineteen thirty six, with the Reds, and he did it on the first pitch he saw. Oh, jeez, came in cold. Space is loaded God. ball game. <laughs> That's the clutchest thing that you could do. Like, mm. I'm just going to walk up here and end it, boys. We're going home. Well, that's the story. That's the story. All every kid tries to like recreate, like the last second shot or the touchdown catch or whatever. Like, you walk up, bases loaded, bought, all that, all the whole thing. And he did it as a pinch hitter, not having hit in that game yet. First pitch. Smacks it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We ain't got batting cages in the clubhouse. We ain't got a we ain't got a bite to get warm on. Like it's just like, hey, grab a bat. What's the baseball equivalent of onions? That's that was that's what this would be. (laughs) 
<laughs> triple order. Like just <laughs> I love that. Oh, Bill Rafferty. Rafferty? I can't, he Rafferty. can't see any. I'm I'm not convinced he can see anymore. Like his eyes are so squinty. Hey, he doesn't have to. It's tough. He can feel I, the I, moment I, and he knows I, what to say. He just hears the crowd. And he's just like, onions. They must have made a shot. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be. Okay. All right. But that does bring us to your actual trivia question. Sick. And and it's Yankees related because anytime we can do that, we will. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so... The Yankees, I've already told you, in the 1934 offseason made two transactions that dealt particularly with their outfield. They got rid of Babe Ruth. They got rid of Sammy Bird. This guy did not play with them in 1934 or 1935, but they did purchase the contract of another outfielder in that same offseason. Who was it? Oh, good night. Am I actually going to know this person? Oh, is, yeah. 100%. Oh, a hundred. Okay, so it's yeah. it's somebody. So the problem the problem with my Yankees history is I can't remember when they played. Not all of yeah. them, like That's the fair. the eras or the decades in which all of them played. Like you could, I well, could name a bunch of names, but I can't put them in order if I had to. Well, when you have so many, it is hard to track. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so how do I Okay, I gotta also gotta know whether or not they played in the outfield. Okay, this is gonna not. Um Okay, so when what years was this person on the Yankees roster then? Maybe the because again I ha- I have a really hard time putting them into like brackets. So he joined the Yankees in 1936, and he played with the Yankees until 1951, minus three years of, 36 of military to service. Oh, okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Fifteen years with the Yankees. Indeed. Minus... Oh geez, I can see his I can see his face, man. Absolutely, possibly. yeah, I believe it. What, what is his name? Which it's like which one is he? It's like a multiple choice question. I'm gonna just pick Christy C. Matthewson. No. <laughs> Joy, no, it was him and Walter Johnson. Yeah, that, man. As long as it's not Patrick Waugh. Um. Uh. Okay. How else do I? How else do I figure this out? Um. Outfielder, of course. I have two names. Yeah. And I don't I don't even know I can't even say for sure whether either of them played outfield or not, but uh, I have two I names. I have a hunch on who your two names are. So um I'm gonna go with I'm just gonna guess one of them because oh, I can't oh, we're just gonna go. No hints. We're gonna just gonna go for it. I can't I can't think of a way to like like he yeah. played on the Yankees, he was an outfielder, he at military time. If he played anywhere else, I wouldn't know. Probably. He did, he did not. Uh, well, it's, Although he, yeah. he, he semi-famously played minor league baseball somewhere, but I don't know if you would know that. That does not sound familiar, no. Okay. Okay, who am I thinking? Um, okay, uh, uh, Joe DiMaggio. Joe DiMaggio is absolutely the right answer. The <laughs> other person you were thinking of 100% was Mickey Mantle. It was. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mantle, <laughs> Mantle is later. Uh, there's a little gap between those two. I don't think they ever actually played together. But, yeah, Joe DiMaggio. Was, I was, was Mickey Mantle the, an outfielder? Yeah. Oh. Yep, yep, yep. I was going to give you the hint of Marilyn Monroe. Oh. Would that have helped you? That might have. That, that would have. Sol- I think that would have solidified yeah, DiMaggio. Yeah, yeah. If I was still choosing between the two, yeah. And then he... he Pretty famously played triple A ball for the San Francisco Seals. Oh. But I don't know that everybody knows that. Not That's this a, guy. A trivia kind of thing. That so, would yeah, the be. Yankees, the Yankees purchased his contract in 1934. He then played with the Seals again in 34 and 35. He played for the Yankees in 36. Uh, and they did pretty good by bringing him up. Um, so, so DiMaggio was part of one of these two deals, or just in the same offseason? Just he was, in the same, yeah, in the same offseason, they 
Damn. They, Damn. That's like a Brett Favre, Aaron Rodgers kind of just yeah, yeah, one yeah. after the other. Unrelated transaction, but yeah, just boom, boom, boom. Yeah, the outfield uh, was in good hands for a very long time <laughs> in New York. So there you go. There's your trivia. So back to our story. Sammy Bird has retired from baseball and he meets up with an old friend, Bobby Jones, down in Augusta. While hanging out with him, he met the head groundskeeper of Augusta National, Ed Dudley, who eventually would leave to go to Philadelphia. When he does, Bird follows him to get a job uh, in Philadelphia working on a golf course. And this would be the site of his first professional win in 1939. Now, keep in mind, he retired from baseball in 36. So it's not like he just transitioned to starting to win professional events. It took him a couple of years to get his legs and, and to get things moving. But in 1939, he won the Philadelphia Open. While not a PGA event, was a professional golf tournament. So it counts as his first win. That year, 1939, is a big year for him personally. He made the cut for the first time at the U.S. Open, finishing 19th that year, which was also good enough to qualify him for the Masters in 1940. If you're familiar with the way you qualify for the major championships of golf, it's still the same way it kind of was then. A certain number of spots are reserved for the top finishers at the other majors. He made it in, so in 1940, he got to play in the Masters, thus becoming the first and to this point, the only man to ever play in the World Series and the Masters. The only person. Uh, in, in all the people ever no one has qualified for both in all of the billions to ever in everybody ever although, although, although some of those people had a really hard time doing either of the things but right <laughs> very few people did either he did both he got both on us um in 1940 he finished 14th but this led him to his greatest successes in 1941 and 1942 in 1941 he showed up to the masters again and he shot the low round on day three shot a 68 on a day where nobody else could score 70 the weather was bad wind was howling he turned in a 68 to put himself three shots behind the leader in front of him a man who would win 28 pga tour events and two majors craig wood and behind him, someone even non-golf fans may have heard of, Byron Nelson, one of the GOATs on the Mount Rushmore of golf, for sure. Mm -hmm. As he comes down the stretch of day four, though, he faded. His worst round of the tournament was on that Sunday, but he still finished third. And he came back for more in 1942. He entered day three, one shot short of Nelson. But again, he slowed down on the weekend and eventually finished fourth. To his credit, though, here's who he finished behind. In third place was Paul Runyon, who won two PGA championships. In second place was Ben Hogan. And in first place was Byron Nelson. If you're going to lose to some folks, Byron Nelson and Ben Hogan aren't a bad couple to lose to. That's tough. That's, that's tough. Kidding. That's a hell of a podium, and you're just off the side. It's like, <laughs> uh, okay. okay. <laughs> I'll take that and walk away. My man has showed up to the Masters twice and lost to Byron Nelson. <laughs> hey, you know where Byron Nelson is from? Here, right? Somewhere? Texas. Texas? This I thought is, it... This, <laughs> This must some, be what they're talking about with the Texas's back stuff is Byron Nelson. Oh, that's I see. That's what they meant. They, mm. That's what, yeah. Wow. That's deep. <laughs> we had to get it in somewhere. It's deep. Uh, uh, Bird's going to win his first PGA event right here in North Carolina, where we're recording. And the 1942 Greater Greensboro Open, that tournament, now the Wyndham Championship, by the way, sneaky, sneaky, one of the oldest golf tournaments in America. Um, kind of knew that as a thing, but just it, it 
was brought back to me researching this episode. The Greater Greensboro Open, a very important kind of event in the PGA's history. He won it in 1942, beat Ben Hogan by two strokes in that event. And he's kind of getting his sea legs together. Everything's working out for him in the, in the world. Uh, but unfortunately, the world wasn't working out for him or any other athletes or really any other people at that point in history. Obviously, this is when America is going to join World War II. And through 1942 to 45, all the majors in golf were canceled. The PGA Tour seasons were curtailed significantly. There were a couple of years where there's very few. There's, By the way, by the way, this, this irks me. I can find out. I can find out everything about Sammy Bird on like name a date, April 15th, 1928. I can go find out everything that happened in that game, who pitched, how long it took. If you want to research PGA tour history, there's nothing, nothing official. You would have to do. And this is like first world problems. You would have to do the old, microfish newspaper search to mm-hmm. find sports pages that talked about the event and then like go to the right city to pull the microfish that actually had the, the full story. <laughs> like, so there's like, it is hard to find out what events were here, what events were there. If you want to know who's 51st on the PGA tours, all time win list. Good luck. Yeah. Because their I... own website only lists the top 50. That's it. It is a funny. It is a funny thing because we've talked about this with like pro racing, NASCAR, and such back in the day. It's just not something the journalists followed regularly. It's not. It wasn't a mainstream thing. But it's funny that baseball has basically always had that because it's. I mean, it's it's unique to America because we created it, I guess, but. It's uh, it, it has been something. It's like a brainchild of America and basketball. Even basketball, all the stats with basketball and stuff haven't always been kept either. Like rebounds are like fairly new. Blocks are yeah. fairly new in in the world of basketball. So I don't know. It, it that's also an interesting thought and an interesting topic is media coverage of various sports and how it's changed over time. Yeah, that was just. That was just my mini rant there. That it really irked me trying to find this. Uh, so anyway, the the tour was curtailed. We have a, a controversy here to discuss. Bird never won a major to this point, but it's possible that he might have won a major in 1943. Here's my evidence. Uh, there was an event in 1943 called the Chicago Victory National Open. There was no U.S. Open put on by the USGA, but this event was looked at as a replacement of sorts for the U.S. Open. I found one newspaper article that was listing golf events that you could participate in during the wartime to show your patriotic pride, and it listed this event as the replacement for the U.S. Open. A newspaper, the one newspaper article I could find that discussed the event itself uh, also mentioned that it was 41 of the very best professionals in the world and they used the, the language that when Bird won it, it was a major championship win. Now that was in lowercase major. They didn't capitalize the M. But they called it a major championship win. Maybe that meant because it was a professional event. It was a well-attended professional event. But also recall in previous episodes, we've mentioned how the term major and major golf championship and the Grand Slam and these four events was not a common thing and established until into the 1960s. So could we retroact we're not going to do it right it's not actually the u.s open but if everybody thought it was the replacement for the u.s open mm, half hmm. a major like 0.5 majors does it get half a one for this i think you got like- a, I think you got a better argument for it than against it like i mean of course he wasn't given it and no one's going to take it away and at this point no one's going to just like grant his yeah, it just is family, a yeah. major championship, but 
I think you have a better argument for it than against it. Like, and I get, I get that now the tour championship, not the tour. Well, yeah, but yeah, the tour championship, the players championship. Um, there's a, there used to be a world golf championship event that was like heavily considered. Like we got to go play this. Everybody's going to be there. Like there are other events like this. And now the PGA tour is doing that thing with elevated events where it's just the top, whatever. So those are basically major fields without being called a major. Like it just is a little arbitrary. I get what we call a major and why, but, but Mm. mm, they're obviously the four most important, but like, I don't know. I don't know. This is just weird because there wasn't a U.S. Open. We don't know if he would have done this, just like we don't know how the baseball players of the time would have performed. It's just one of those things. War sucks. That war in particular. And, uh, (laughs) you know. But it robbed us of what could have been for Sammy Bird. Uh, in that event, he beat Craig Wood, who had beat him in his first Masters contention. Uh, he would go on in 1944 to win twice, once in New Orleans, once in Philadelphia. Uh, he beat Nelson, who he had struggled with previously. And in 1945, he opened the year down in Texas in January, beating Byron Nelson in his home state by a single stroke and setting the Texas open record in the process. Again, this is no slouch playing golf. He set the tournament record there uh, in beating Byron Nelson. And this all led up to 1945 and the last chance he had to compete in a major. And it was the 1945 PGA championship. Let me tell you how absolutely bonkers this event was. We would never do this today, but it would be the best thing on TV, okay? (laughs) So so 73 players were invited. On Monday and Tuesday, they played 36 holes of stroke play. So just 18 holes a day. Yeah, wait, time out. They're starting starting a major on a Monday. On a Monday. Okay. We got a a whole week for you. So on Monday and (laughs) Tuesday... The entire field, nobody got an exemption except last year's winner. The entire field played Monday and Tuesday, 36 holes stroke play. The top 31 plus the previous champion would be allowed to move on to the, and I love this, the match play portion of the event. It wasn't all just stroke play. I would love for there to be a major championship that featured some match play and some different Mm. gimmicks. Yeah, uh, but but the, and it, they did at the top. Bird uh, finished the qualifying round in tenth place. To point out the struggles that are finding golf records, I have no idea who he played in the first round. And by I have no idea, I mean Wikipedia, not the greatest source ever. It starts in the round. It starts in the quarterfinals. The PGA Championships website starts in the round of sixteen. And nowhere mentioned who he played or how he won in round number one. But he did because he showed up <laughs> in his round of 16 match where he beat Johnny Revolta 2-1. and one. By the way, these are all 36-hole matches. My goodness. So on Wednesday, they played the round of 32. On Thursday, they played the round of 16. 36 holes, he won 2-1. and one. In the quarters and the semis, he won seven and six. So he was up seven holes <laughs> with six holes left. Those are smokes. He rolled those dudes. There was no chance. Uh, and this set up a final against guess who? Bum, guess who's bum, bum, bum. Do you really Byron know? Nelson. Yes, it's Byron <laughs> Nelson. He's going to face Byron Nelson in the final. And so we meet again. Right? And I understand Craig Wood has also been featured in this story as well, but it's not as fun as Byron Nelson being his competitor on Sunday. Again, they're going to play 36 holes of match play. At this point, they've played over a hundred holes of golf. Well over a hundred holes of golf. It's time for 36 more. In the morning 18, Bird was absolutely on fire. He scored four birdies in a row to close that round two holes up. And in the first four holes of the afternoon session, he pushed his lead to three. He's up three holes. There are only 14 holes remaining. 
But unfortunately, this is Sammy Bird in a major we're talking about. And all stories can't have happy endings. By the end of hole 10, the players were all squared. So essentially, he lost three of the next four holes. And on the back nine, Byron Nelson would win holes 11, 12, 13, and 14 to put him up four holes. And then when he won 15, or sorry, when he halved 15, the match was over. Byron Nelson was the winner, four and three of that major tournament. It was the closest Sammy Bird ever came to winning a major, and it was his last opportunity to do so. He would appear in a few more Masters and U.S. Opens, uh, usually missing the cut. He made two more cuts, but never uh, in this level of contention again. He famously, at his last Masters, I believe it was hole two, uh, recorded the highest score ever to that point, and then he quit playing the Masters (laughs) after that year. Uh, There was no senior PGA tour for him to go to, no champions tour, uh, nothing like that. He would eventually, when the tours were created, play a little bit there. He did win a senior PGA tour event, but he retired from golf having won six events. This is normally where I would tell you some fancy things about his career stats. Uh, His career batting average doesn't actually qualify to be on baseball references all time list. If it did, it would be in the high 800s, which is to say, that the way he played baseball is better than all but 800 people. Like we, we make this guy a trivia question. He played in the world series. He played in the masters, his career. He was kind of a a reserve, but he, he, what he didn't suck, right? This wasn't the dude at the end of the bench, just kind of there hanging on. He, he was an important player on the teams and he didn't suck in golf. I would tell you where he places all time on the wins list, but again, You have to be in the top 50, and I believe you have to have 18 wins there to be placed in the top 50. If anybody can find out where he ranks all time and let us know, that'd be great. Um, But I could not find out. I'm still getting over how many golf holes they had to play in that (laughs) seven-day long tournament having to play stroke play for two days. And then five days of 36 hole match play. So I just did the math. They were scheduled 216 holes. They didn't play them all because of the match play. You can end early. But yeah. 216 oh, holes. My. Were scheduled. I start giving out on like 13. Just, just, just one, just one round. <laughs> That's incredible. But that, that thing aside, it's, it's still just ridiculous. And and every once in a while in these stories, I thought about this when you're talking about the wartime stuff and yes, war suck. And that's when he was playing his best golf. And that's when he arguably won a replacement for a major championship. And that's arguably when he could have won a major championship if they were still happening. But it's, uh, it's, it's just incredible that he was that good anyway to be there like the the wartime may have cut may have cut his wins a little shorter than they would have been uh the the wartime probably did that to a lot of players i I mean we've talked about we've talked about how world war ii basically canceled the world for a few years world war ii was a terrible uh a terrible time in sports but Um, It is uh, it is quite it was quite the disruptor, obviously, in the world total, but it uh, it did a lot of damage to everybody. But um, it's like you said, I'm we'll we'll just say this war sucks, especially especially this one, because it very well may have taken a major away from him if they did exist. Uh, And that would have been really, really cool if he had won one both, but even just appearing in all the ones that he did and winning the six tournaments he won. That's still something that no one else could say. Yeah, no, I, it is, it is. And, and for somebody that is kind of a, a trivia question that may pop up on the masters, it may pop around open and day as you're watching baseball games um, for him to actually have had the two careers. is pretty good. That's a, that's a good sports life. He's, 
he's Man. led. Yeah. But, yeah, um, plenty of people, plenty of people would die to just have one of his careers. Like you see, you see the uh, golf related, uh, the golf related thing, how Tiger, you could split Tiger Woods' career into three Hall of Fame careers. In, independently. Yeah. Independently. Like he could have, he could have made the Hall of Fame three different times in the 25 years that he's been a, 25 years ish that he's been a professional. This guy has had two all world sports careers in two different sports back to back, not at the same time, like not, not Dion and Bo playing both sports at their prime when they had all the energy that they were ever going to have when they were at their physical peak. He did one and then did another, like con- they call that a concurrent sentence. <laughs> <laughs> But but is golf a sport is really what we need to do. No, I'm just kidding. We're not doing that. Please don't start um, that right now. <laughs> we're not doing that at all. All right. Um, so, yeah, that's that's our story for today. Again, shout out to uh, our listener, Corey, for giving us the idea. We got a couple of his ideas coming up, actually. And if you... Want to let us know a thought or an idea that you have? We would gl- be glad to research and bring that to you as well. Just let us know on our socials. Uh, but until next time, that's what you don't know about the first man, the only man to play in the World Series in the Masters, Sammy Bird. Thanks for listening. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of What You Don't Know About Sports. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please leave us a review, five stars only please, and hit that subscribe button wherever you listen. If you have a great sports story, we want to hear about it. You can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at WYDKAS Podcast, and on our YouTube channel at What You Don't Know About Sports Podcast. All episodes are written, recorded, and edited by us. Stay tuned for the next episode.